Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lockwell here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Sergio Armadi returns to UBS, replacing Ralph Hammers as group chief executive 10 days after the bank's deal to acquire Credit Suisse. Armadi just told the news conference to give him a couple of months to come up with answers. Europe follows Asian stocks into the green despite uncertainty over the Fed's path for rates and reports of a deal slowdown from Jefferies and Goldman. Plus, Alibaba drives gains in Asia after the tech giant announces a six-way split of its business, easing concerns around Beijing's treatment of the private sector. So good morning, everyone. I have to say that was the latest twist in a pretty interesting uh, Swiss banking story. Now, we look at the markets, but a lot of the focus today will be on Credit Suisse and UBS. Um, we still have an ongoing press conference with Mr. Ramadi, Mr. Hammers, and Mr. Kelleher. The picture overall is actually one of a bit more optimism, certainly, that we saw in the last couple of days. Stocks up. U.S. futures also rising. This is on the back of some encouraging news of Alibaba. That seems to be boding well for Chinese technology companies, and that's giving a nice lift to technology companies also in Europe. But amongst the 20 groups that make up the stock 600, it's definitely the biggest gainer. And then I'm looking at Treasuries. A little changed after the two-year yield rose eight basis points yesterday at the 10-year equivalent to climbed four basis points. So we'll look at, of course, uh, not only Alibaba, but a raft of data on the U.S. economy this week, including the central bank's preferred measure of inflation, the so-called core PC deflator, which is likely to factor into the Fed's next policy uh, decision. So we look at the markets overall, but really the main story today is Sergio Ramadi. He's back. UBS has named him in a surprise move less than two weeks after taking over rival Credit Suisse. Ramadi returns to a role he held from 2011 to 2020, while Ralph Hammers will stay on as an advisor for a transition period. Well, we just heard from UBS and incoming chief executive Sergio Ramadi at a press conference talking about steering the ship following the take over the responsibilities uh, that are coming with this important task and the expectations uh, and uh, I'm fully aware that we need to work very hard here to avoid uh, any consequences for the taxpayers in Switzerland so uh, I think uh, you have my word and commitment that I together with my team we will work and do everything that it takes to make this transaction successfully. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Claudia Medler, our Zurich Bureau Chief, Michael Moore, Senior Finance Editor, and Paul Davies, our Banking and Finance Opinion Columnist. Now, Bloomberg TV has also known Sergio Motti very well. He's one of the most able bankers, probably, of his generation. He delivered at UBS when he was in charge the first time, simplifying the structure, taking a lot of risk out, and, of course, focusing on wealth management. Uh, Claudia, when you look at some of the main challenges here, and, again, what he said in the press conference was very clear, in, in very clear Aramati style. It's like, give me a couple of months. We need to get this right in terms of execution. And does it, was it important that he's Swiss? Well, they said that it, uh, it wasn't the deciding factor, but, you know, clearly he is Swiss and he also has, you know, all this experience previously at UBS for nine years. He really, really knows the bank very well. And as you said, he has delivered before. So the expectation here obviously is that he can pull it off again. Obviously, this is a, a massive, um, a massive yeah, takeover. Uh, one of the biggest we've seen, um, I think it was um, the chairman who argued that. Um, so this is a, a mammoth task that he will have to have to complete. And there are many, many questions that are still open, you know, questions around jobs, questions around what's going to happen with the Swiss unit of Credit Suisse. So there's, uh, you know, still many, many playing parts here that he'll have to figure out in the coming months. Yeah, so we're getting a couple of headlines from that press conference. Um, Sergio Ramadi saying it, he, it, it always felt to him like his next chapter was a transaction like this. He also says he felt uh, a sense of a call of duty. Interesting to me, Paul, and you've been writing extensively on this for Bloomberg Opinion with some really fantastic work, that, you know, it's really the chairman that masterminded this. He started by saying that he called Sergio Ramadi right from the beginning, or I think the Monday after, you know, they put the deal together. What did he see in Ramadi that will drive this through? I mean, obviously, like you say, the experience of having, you know, managed a, a major restructuring of the investment bank before, you know, he knows UBS inside out. You know, he'll know Credit Suisse reasonably well as well. He knows the investment banking business especially. I mean, that was kind of one of the weaknesses of, uh, of Hammers 
uh, in terms of when how people assessed him when he first joined as, as, as UBS CEO. He doesn't have an investment banking background. And that's probably going to be one of the, you know, the, the thorniest, most complicated, most culturally tricky you know, elements of this, of this deal. So it's, it's important to really get that right. Yeah, and Paul, when you look at, you know, I guess the experience of, of Sergio Ramadi, again, we, you know, everybody knows him pretty well. This is someone that wanted to beat Credit Suisse day in, day out. So he probably has also a, a very good understanding of some of the risk out there. Do we think that he, the UBS has laid out, um, of course, some of the plan, like $8 billion in cuts, what they want to do with the Swiss bank. Do you think Sergio Ramadi could change any of that? I mean, I guess all of it was sort of up for change anyway. I mean, you've got to remember a lot of this... Uh, strategy. A lot of the plans were done really sort of on the back of an envelope in, in very, very short order uh, as they were trying to get this deal over the line. Um, and they've got to be, you know, very careful and cautious in how, as how they go about it. I mean, you mentioned earlier the, the, uh, the importance to taxpayers of getting this right. You know, there are these huge, potentially huge government guarantees in place for, you know, the liquidity line and also the kind of the second order losses as they sell down some of the non-core assets yeah. and that sort of thing. So... There is sort of taxpayers' money at risk, yeah. and then there's also this huge domestic bank that's been created as well. I was reminded, actually, uh, Zoe Schneeweiss, thank you so much for reminding me of some of the great, fantastic stories that we have been writing on Sergio Ramadi through the years. And there's one where he says, I think this is from 2017, so three years before he stepped down, Michael Moore, Ramadi says, nothing is ever certain, not even UBS staying Swiss. I mean, if he only he known back then what we know now, how does he keep all of his constituents happy? So he needs to make sure that UBS shareholders are happy. They were used to dividends coming back, shareholders yeah. being quite happy with some of the money giving back. It was a pretty boring, uh, you know, wealth bank. He needs to keep the bankers happy to give some certainty on, on job losses or not. And then he has to keep the Swiss authorities happy. Yeah, and I think it's telling that he mentioned the Swiss government, the Swiss taxpayers. Uh, there is a lot of scrutiny on this deal when you take the two biggest banks in a country and merge them together. Uh, there's you know, a reason why in this announcement they talked about for the good of the country they were doing this. Um, so there is a lot of scrutiny on this. Uh, they have to act quickly to try to wind down the pieces that they don't want because their shareholders are used to stability, to dividends and capital returns, and they want to return to that as soon as possible. So he did a lot. Again, when Sergio Ermati left UBS, it was one of the strongest banks in having dealt with, uh, you know, COVID or certainly with the lockdowns. He also spoke to Armanis Kranny right before leaving. This was October in 2020, and he kind of explained the strategy through what he'd done. Uh, I uh, stabilized the bank further, uh, put the bank into a new path uh, of uh, uh, strategic uh, clarity, uh, uh, and uh, I would say that we uh, um, uh, capital strengths uh, and uh, solidity, and also operational resilience, and most importantly, I think that. Uh, um, uh, you know, reinforced uh, the culture and uh, not what we do, but also how we do things in, in the organization. Uh, Claudia, if you look at, you know, the, the Swiss, of course, authorities, first of all, they came under huge, huge pressure, which they had to justify for wiping out those AT1s. But also they now have a massive bank that they need to regulate. What's the level of angst amongst the, the Swiss government right now? Well, I, could, I think you could see it very well in the papers over the weekend. Like the Swiss finance minister first, she came out and gave a very long interview, kind of justifying all the actions that had happened the previous week. And similarly, on Sunday, then the um, regulator came out and, and did a similar thing, kind of, you know, again, backing, explaining. And we've seen a lot of that um, in the papers over the past, you know, days. Um, and that is because, you know, the Swiss public isn't really uh, behind this deal. Many, many people are concerned. They're worried about what's going to happen um, to, to their own, um, you know, to their own relationship with, with the one they had with Credit Suisse. And companies are concerned as well because they obviously, they, they are used to banking, um, many of them, with two banks. And now suddenly there is one and there will be a lot less bargaining power for them. So there's a lot of concern. And on top of that, obviously, this idea that the taxpayer might have to foot some of the bill. Yeah, what are some of the other things, Paul, that you're hearing? So the, the, the investment bank is, is the worrisome, right? How much of it will be booked in London? And actually, how much will it be difficult to either sell parts or unwind it? 
So I guess the, the, some of the trickiest stuff is, uh, I mean, as Colin Kelleher was saying the other Sunday, they've got this long-term, you know, derivatives positions that were already in Credit Suisse's non-core book that, were, that had this kind of, like, slow path to run down. And I think they want to get rid of some of those more quickly. And that's the kind of thing where you'd have to, you know, you'd lose money to kind of get rid of them faster. Um, but then, I mean, I think... You know, even more than the financial positions, the kind of the trickiest thing is going to be getting to the Credit Suisse bankers that you want to keep quickly and convincing them that they should stay and that it's worth their while yeah. staying and, and then trying to knit them into the enlarged group. Paul, do you have any doubt that now they have the A-team? Actually, if you have Ramadi back, Kelleher seems to firmly in charge. And again, the chairman in Switzerland has much more power. I mean, is there any reason to think this will fail? I mean, it's still going to be very tricky to do it and get it all right. I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, Marty obviously has a huge amount of experience, as we've been saying. Uh, I'm sure he's a, I, I mean, I personally think he's a better man for the job than, than Hamers would have been to knit these two things together. But, you know, there's a, there's a lot of potential problems. And there's, there was a lot of franchise damage done at Credit Suisse already. And it's sort of, you know, how you stop the rot of clients leaving, you know, losing revenue, losing key staff and that sort of thing. Whether UBS can do that quickly enough with what they want to keep of Credit Suisse is going to be the big challenge. All right. Thank you so much for all of the stellar panel. Claudia Midler, our Zurich Bureau Chief, Michael Moore, our Senior Finance Editor, and Paul Davies, our Banking and Finance Opinion Columnist. Now, we'll have plenty more live throughout the program. Space to raise borrowing costs further also. ECB Governing Council member Madis Muller feels bold despite the banking turmoil, so we'll focus on the ECB next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, we're just getting, of course, uh, more breaking news from UBS. We've talked quite extensively of UBS. There was a press conference with Mr. Hammers, Mr. Kelleher, and Mr. Aramati. Uh, Mr. Kelleher finally saying that, look, they do not want to change the complexion of the balance sheet, that the Swiss Bank of Credit Suisse and the wealth management is probably clean, but they don't really know what to do with the investment bank. So the culture problem, Mr. Kelleher says, and it does seem that the chairman, Colm Kelleher, is firmly in charge here, saying that the culture problem was primarily at the Credit Suisse Investment Bank. We also understand from our sources that that will mainly be something that they're looking at here in London. Um, Mr. Hal Kelleher also saying there were clearly parts of Credit Suisse that had a bad culture. Now, we'll keep an eye on Credit Suisse UBS, UBS for the moment, gaining some 2.6%. Now, ECB hawks are Feeling bold and despite banking troubles, the central bank's governing council member, Madis Muller, said there's probably space to raise borrowing costs further. He told Bloomberg that while inflation is slowing, risks continue to be skewed to the upside. Joining us with the very latest is Agnes Belaish, chief European strategist at Bearings. Agnes, thank you for joining us. When you look at some of the concerns in the European economy, a lot of the focus is on the credit crunch and some of the credit available to, to small and medium-sized enterprises. How, do you, how much do you worry, actually, about the future of the Eurozone? Um, well, we, um, in February, we called our uh, outlook uh, stagflation haze um, because we saw a very complicated policy mix uh, for, for the central bank in the sense that there is a really a typical growth and inflation combination with really persistent inflation, but solid uh, growth as well. Um, and you could see that, that growth uh, is not relying that much on credit. Uh, credit growth to household is growing around 2 3%. is not massive, um, as it is in the US. Um, corporates are relying a little bit on it, but they are really liquid as well. So this not not a real credit crunch right now that is stopping growth and therefore it's very complicated for for the ecb in particular to figure out you know the, the pace of hikes and, and we do see um the, the we do listen rather to the ecb telling us that they will have more to do and, and we do see in this outlook uh, a couple more hikes uh, this year first half of this year uh, uh, agnes what happens after a couple of more hikes does the economy really suffer do you worry about job losses so there are three atypical factors in this combination, and this is how I'm going to uh, answer you. The first one is that there is a labor shortage that has provided uh, workers with some wage bargaining power. 
So I don't, you know, th there is some um, layoffs probably going on in some industries that have overhired during the pandemic, but in the, but there is still a really strong demand for labor and wages, you know, the ECB actually forces wage growth in this year of 5%, which is quite significant after 37 last year. So it's, there's no real issue of, of, um, of job losses. And you could see in the confidence surveys released this week, on uh, these past weeks on the consumer side as well on the business uh, side as well as in the PMIs last week actually that uh, employment remains strong and confidence remains strong. The second a typical factor just to, to conclude that, uh, the, that that story which is quite interesting is that firms also have realized they have a pricing power so they are passing these extra costs on to consumer prices and consumers are less confident are, are less sensitive to that uh, simply because they have excess savings still from the pandemic. So there's a mixture of factors playing at once that make for a quite solid economy in the euro area. Um, Agnes, how do you look at the banking crisis? So we just had that press conference between UBS, well, not just UBS actually, with the, the latest twist, Mr. Amadi coming through. Do you worry about the soundness of the banking system and maybe some of the concerns that we saw with Deutsche Bank impacting the real economy? So I said we call it the, the stagflation haze and the just gotten hazier with this financial stress. Um, but one should, one should not confuse uh, problems in the US um, in some very peculiar banks, uh, regional banks with a lot of corporate uh, depositors, very concentrated, that are looking for a remuneration for their deposits. And uh, issues in Switzerland with um, a bank that had been losing value for for at least a year um, before now, so 60% fall in uh, credit risk equity price up to, up to now, with problems in the euro area per se. I mean, people are looking for, are trying to, to look for, for the little story in Europe, and they were betting, you know, the, the CDS uh, speculation against uh, Deutsche Bank, and, and I think the ECB is inquiring into that. And you had a, quite, quite an interesting article about that. That you know, this market is completely unliquid, and it doesn't like that much to move the market. But but if you look, um, you know, at, at European banks, they are super liquid. In fact, they hold 27% yeah. of deposits at the ECB, which they can liquidate whenever they want if there is if there is a need for liquidity. The capital ratios are also really really strong. Um, so the, the vulnerability yeah. of the banking system in the euro area is not that big. Agnes, thank you so much. Agnes Belaish, their chief European strategist at Bearings. Coming up, Alibaba shares having, have soared after the e-commerce giant announced a massive overhaul plan. So we'll bring you the story next, and this is Bloomberg. Sergio swiftly transformed the investment bank by cutting its footprint and achieved a profound culture change within the bank which allowed it to regain the trust of clients and other stakeholders while restoring people's pride in working for UBS. This unique experience, together with its deep understanding of the financial service industry in Switzerland and globally, makes Sergio ideally placed to successfully lead the combined entity. Well, that was the UBS chairman, Colm Kelleher. I have to say, in the last couple of minutes, he definitely gave us the quote of the year, saying that the task of integrating uh, Credit Suisse is actually bigger than any deal that was executed during the height of the financial crisis in 2008. And remember, he was at Morgan Stanley then. So uh, this is quite a huge deal, uh, the latest, actually, in the twist at UBS. We have the press conference that I think is about to wrap up. On the back of that, UBS getting some 2.3%. The chairman saying, that look, Armadi's term has no time limit. He says that UBS needs to avoid consequences for taxpayers on the Credit Suisse deal. Sergio Armadi also leading that press conference, saying that he needs a couple of months to figure out exactly tactically how they move. Now, onto technology and Alibaba shares have surged in Hong Kong today after the e commerce giants announced plans to split its $2020 billion empire into six business units. The major restructuring promises to bring it with it several initial public offerings. So you can see Alibaba pre-market down 1.3%. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg Sofia Ortaï Costa. Sofia, what does the plan actually entail? 
Good morning, Francine. So, um, yes, yeah, splitting into six different businesses, this essentially unlocks shareholder value because right now Alibaba is valued like a conglomerate, uh, not like a tech company, not like an e-commerce company, and certainly not like an AI company, and that's a business it wants to go into. Uh, we don't know uh, some, cer certain things that we don't know, and we might get some clarity. There's a, an 8 a.m. press conference, 8 a.m. Hong Kong time tomorrow um, by Alibaba's executives, and we don't know what the timeline will be. So when does Alibaba actually plan to uh, do this restructuring? How long will it take? And uh, what kind of spin-off are, are we kind of expecting when it comes to IPOs? Where will the IPOs be? I mean, this is in incredibly important for a valuation perspective. If Alibaba does decide to IPO some of its business units onshore, it could really get a higher valuation. There's a scarcity factor there because there's not, not a lot of tech giants onshore. Um, we could, again, get some clarity. 8 a.m. Hong Kong time tomorrow, Francine. Sophia, thank you so much. Sophia Arta Ecosta will be back. We'll have plenty more on technology. We'll talk a lot about the European economy and, of course, UBS. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, UBS, without a doubt, our biggest story today. Uh, the UBS chairman, Colm Kelleher, seems to be driving the change. Of course, just two hours ago, we found out um, out of the blue that Sergio Armati was now the new group chief executive. Colm Kelleher saying that actually integrating Credit Suisse is bigger than any deal that was executing executed during the height of the financial crisis back in 2008. Now, some of the things also that he says, uh, the Q&A at the press conference just finishing, he, um, you know, said that Sergio Armati was actually the better horse uh, to execute the deal. It's, it really goes back, I guess, to, to Kelleher's Irish roots and maybe some of the love uh, for racehorses. But a question on why Armati is a better pilot to lead this project hammers really laughed awkwardly. We're getting information from people that were at the press conference on the ground. Uh, Kelleher stepping in and answering that. He basically says, uh, you know, we felt we had a better horse with Sergio and it has nothing to do with Hammer's performance. We also heard from Sergio Ramadi basically saying that, look, it will take a couple of months for him really to get to the bottom of it. And then they spent an extensive time also uh, talking about the investment bank, uh, Mr. Kelleher saying that the Swiss bank, the wealth management, it's probably clean, but that the culture problem, he believes, was primarily at a Credit Suisse investment bank. He also said clearly there were parts of Credit Suisse that had a bad culture. UBS at the moment on the back of that press conference gaining 2.6%. Now, we did hear from the UBS group incoming chief executive officer. Take a listen. The responsibilities uh, that are coming with this important task and the expectations, uh, and uh, I'm fully aware that we need to work very hard here to avoid uh, any consequences for the taxpayers in Switzerland. So uh, I think uh, you have my word and commitment that I, together with my team, we will work and do everything that it takes to make this transaction successful. Now, joining us to discuss the moves we've seen this morning, Michaela Markison, Société Générale's Group Chief Economist. Michaela, I'm going to take you out a little bit out of your comfort zone a little bit, and thank you for joining us. Do you worry about the stability of the banking system, given what we've lived through in the last two weeks? Honestly, no. I think when we look at the situation today compared to 2008, we're in a very different situation. The banks are well capitalized, and I think when we look at the toolkit that the ECB has to deal both with the sovereign fragmentation, which of course was a, a big issue for Europe back in the early 2010, there's a, a very big toolkit in place to deal with this dimension of any problems. And on top of that, the ECB has shown uh, that it has ample tools to help address liquidity. So I'm not concerned that we're heading for this type of a, a financial crisis. What I am watching very closely is the credit impulse to the euro area economy. And we saw from uh, the data coming out, we do see the credit impulse slowing. This is the, the normal channel that you would expect monetary policy be, to be working through. We do see that credit impulse slowing. And I think what's key now, um, 
in building uh, confidence in the markets around the banking system. Uh, we'll see the first quarter results coming out soon, and I think this is going to be an important moment for the markets. And then when I think when we look at the economic fundamentals, uh, we'll be getting uh, more data in terms of the bank lending survey. And for the ECB, they really need to make sure um, that they're not over-tightening conditions and slowing credit down too much, because I think that's going to be the important yep. factor for the economy. But so, Michaela, and we have seen already some charts actually, you know, seeing uh, the, the credit availability and how that's been impacted <laughs> even before what we lived through in, in the last couple of weeks. How bad does it get before <coughs> the ECB slows down? Like, if there's a lagging, uh, you know, monetary policy, when do we find out the real picture of what we're living through? Well, I think this is always a big challenge for the central banks is that monetary policy works with long and uncertain lags. And this is something that we know quite well. This is also why central banks meet quite often. It's precisely for this reason. So I, I'm looking ahead here. And when I look at the credit impulse numbers, when I look at the overall macro numbers, my view is maybe the ECB goes one or two rate hikes more. Um, this is certainly what we get from the speak at the moment. But I think the ECB will be cutting rates before the end of this year uh, to address uh, a, a slowing economy. Uh, my outlook is below the consensus. And, and I think we mm -hmm. see that momentum already slowing quite substantially. Uh, Miguel, what are you expecting the Fed to do? To, to cut or not to cut by your end? I think the Fed will cut as well. Um, I, I have a, a call um, for both central banks to cut by the end of this year. Will we get one more rate hike from the Fed? I think that depends a, a lot on both what happens in the financial markets, how, how quickly the markets calm down a little bit, and also what happens on the, the data coming in. But just looking at some of the leading indicators, I do expect uh, quite a substantial slowdown of the U.S. economy. Um, I do think we get a mild recession um, sometime in, in the second half, early 2024. And uh, once we see those type of numbers coming in, I think the Fed will start to cut. But I think both in the case of the ECB and in the case of the Fed, that rate cutting cycle, at least initially, is likely to be quite slow. So, you know, depending on where you see the, the neutral rate being uh, at this point in time, we probably still have tightening, we still probably still have a, a tight monetary policy, even as the central banks start to cut. So, Mikael, where do you see euro dollar? And I don't know whether, you know, if dollar goes down, then this also changes everything. So, so I, I think the, the, the currency channel is, of course, important for the European economies. But I think we, we really need to, to look at what's, what's going to be happening to the trade-weighted euro. I think this one is, is the key. And I think another big question is, of course, also what's happening in terms of the commodity prices, the energy prices in particular, I think those will be important signals for the ECB because they are worried uh, still about a, a price wage uh, spiral building. We've heard this from mm -hmm. President Lagarde on, on several occasions now. So I think basically this is, this is what they're looking for. But as we, as we come out of, of, uh, of the, the current situation, I do think we could see a little bit of strength in the euro, but I'm not looking for a, a hugely yeah. sharp appreciation at this point. Michael, going back to the banks, one of the things that we're trying to figure out is also, you know, because we're always on our phones and it's easier to transfer money or to, to take deposits out, does this change regulation around some of the banks and therefore does that change the, the type of economy we're left with? Well, I think we, we, there, there's, there's quite a few questions in what you're asking me there, Francine, because I think, you know, there's the immediate question of what type of potential regulatory changes will be in the pipeline for the U.S. where a, a choice was made uh, to, to change the thresholds. As we've heard from the European officials, um, the various thresholds are, are quite different here in Europe. Um, so I think this is a, a first point to keep in mind. A second big question is, of course, uh, what happens in terms of digital currencies, central bank digital currencies. But uh, this is not something we have on, on, the, on the table today. Uh, and of course, the design of such digital currencies will be absolutely uh, critical, and especially in terms of the structural ability to create credit to the real economy. I think this is really the, the key thing that I focus on as a macroeconomist. So I think there's quite a lot mm -hmm. of questions mm -hmm. out there in, in terms of what happens in the US now, what happens to a digital currency. 
But the key point perhaps to make in, in, in the case of the U.S. is that yes, we, we have seen deposits moving around, but the deposits are not leaving the banking system. They're moving between one bank and the other. Now, that's not to say that cannot be disruptive, um, but it's not a flight away, it's not a flight to cash. That's not what we're seeing in the U.S. Michaela, thanks so much. As always, Michaela Markison, Group Chief Economist of Société Générale. Now let's go back to our top story. Sergio Ramadi returning to run UBS as it incorporates Credit Suisse. The surprise announcement comes less than two weeks after UBS agreed to acquire its Swiss rival. Now for more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Swiss finance reporter, Marion Hoftemeyer, who's also at the press conference. Marion, I have to say it was a pretty extraordinary press conference. And if, if anyone had any doubts, there's no longer any doubts. Like the chairman is firmly in charge here. <laughs> Yes, exactly. I mean, we had probably the three most powerful bankers in Switzerland in the room today discussing this executive change, this very important executive change. Um, and, you know, Colm Kelleher, the chairman, could not stress enough how big of a deal this merger between Credit Suisse and UBS is, arguably bigger than any deal that happened during the 2008 financial crisis. How worrying is this, Marion? So first of all, if you look at how they put the two together, there are questions, of course, about Credit Suisse, so how they keep their employees happy, shareholders of UBS that were used to giving, you know, getting back in terms of dividend and, and share buybacks, but also they need to keep the, the Swiss government on side. Were you surprised on how much the focus was on Switzerland? I wasn't necessarily surprised. Switzerland is a banking country, so they are going to be very involved in, you know, making sure that their two big national champions are stable. And in this case, the best option was merging them. Um, that being said, you know, the 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 international aspects of this are can't be discounted, and that was really what this drove this choice a little bit. Was you know, Sergio Amati has had a lot of experience steering this bank um, and bringing it to stability. Now, of course, Ralph Hammers, the current CEO, has said the situation has changed, and Ralph. Um, Sergio Massi was the better candidate in this case than continuing on the previous strategy with Ralph Hammers. Marion, thanks so much. Marion Hoftofmeyer there in Zurich, just inside actually the press conference that she followed for us over there at HQ of UBS. Coming up, Italy's biggest gas distributor, Ital Gas, is in exclusive talks to buy Veolia's Italian water assets. We'll speak to the chief executive, Paolo Gallo. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. So Italy's biggest gas distributor, Ital Gas, says it's in exclusive talks with Veolia to acquire stakes in Italian water companies owned by the French group. Well, to discuss that and plenty more, I'm joined by Ital Gas Chief Executive Officer, he's Paolo Gallo. Uh, Mr. Gallo, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, there's a lot Good going morning. on, actually, with Ital Gas. First of all, you're in one of the most exciting, if uncertain, <laughs> right, if, um, industries because of gas and what happened in Ukraine. You've also been buying up operations here and there. How do you see the future of Ital Gas? Well, you, you know, the future of Ital Gas has been designed uh, starting back in 2017 when we emerged from SNAM. And uh, the main goal is what we call digital transformation of the company. Uh, since then, we have gone through a uh, heavy digitization uh, of our network in view of the energy transitions. Right. Uh, thanks to the, ener to the uh, digitization of the network, we will be able to handle very soon yeah different kind of gases, yeah. low carbon, zero carbon gases, such as biomethane, uh, hydrogen, synthetic gas. And uh, that is our goal. By yeah. end of 2023, 90% uh, of our network will be fully digitized okay. and remotely controlled. I mean, in the meantime, so yesterday, <laughs> not yesterday, last week, you bought yeah. a, a Greek infrastructure, DEPA. There's yeah. also talk of you buying some of the water assets of Veolia in, in yeah. southern Italy. Is there anything else on the table that you'd like to acquire? Well, there is already a lot of things to do. Uh, I mean, you mentioned Greek. Greek has been a big transaction that we did last year. Uh, was in September. We we did the closing the first of September. Now we are uh, organizing the operation, and our goal in Greece is to do in a shorter period of time exactly what we have done in Italy. So, fully digitize the network to be able to handle different kind of gases. Regarding Veolia, it's an exclusive agreement, exclusive talks that we have with them. Hopefully by, let's say, beginning of May, we should be able to close the deal with them. 
our interest is to buy assets in the water distribution because we think that all the technologies and competence that we were able to bring into gas distribution, mm -hmm. if applied to the water distribution, will be a big step forward in reducing the leakages that there are in the water distribution system. So, uh, Mr. Gallup, talk to me a little bit about the, the energy complex in general yeah. and how we'll use gas. H how does that change with the energy transition? There's also a lot of talk from European leaders saying, look at the U.S., they're transitioning far quicker. Um, because of the Inflation Reduction Act. So where does it leave the energy complex in Europe? Yeah, it, let, let me say that if you just talk about the energy transition, you miss two other points that have become extremely important in this day. The first one is security of supply, mm -hmm. and the second one is the competitiveness of the, our industry, is what I call the trilemma between energy transition, security of supply, and uh, competitiveness yeah. of uh, the industry. A, a if, nightmare to figure out, if you don't well, mind me saying. Well, it's not a nightmare, it's a great opportunity, <laughs> okay, you know? Yeah, so, if before energy transition was the only topics that we were talking about now, mm -hmm. the other two have become much more important. Security supply was given mm -hmm. in the past, now it's not given anymore, and competitiveness in, of the industry is extremely important for the European state member. So we need to work on these three points, three angles, trying to have not prejudice to anyone. I mean, uh, renewable gas should be as good as the electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the, on the other side, uh, we should try to leverage all the mm -hmm. assets that we have in order to reduce uh, accelerate the transition but reduce the cost for the final customer and as a customer you just want stable prices I mean actually yeah, ideally exactly. you want much cheaper prices both if you're private or a company but also at least stable prices do you think that will be the case going forward in the next 12 months I, I we have seen a big declining in the price regarding the gas I think there will be a little bit more now that the winter is over and I think with all the diversification of supply especially in Italy that we have seen uh, in the last uh, 12 months, uh, mm -hmm. I'm quite confident that the gas will remain at very competitive price, yeah. at least not probably as the price that we had during the COVID period, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. 30 to 40 euro per megawatt hour is probably the right price at which the ga gas will stay mm -hmm. over the 12 month, what, next 12 months. And, and what did you learn in the last 12 months and how we adapted, I mean, 14 months really from the invasion of Ukraine, how we adapted quickly to the new reality and trying to find alternative sources? Well, from, from our side, uh, we were already in the process to accelerate energy efficiency activity inside our company. And uh, with the war in Ukraine, we accelerate those action. Mm -hmm. The reality is that at the end of 2022, we were recording minus 20% in terms of energy efficiency. So gas consumption, electricity consumption, thanks to all the action putting in place. But I think the same happened also in Italy. I mean, we were surprised by the fact that during November and December, the majority of the saving didn't come from the mild weather, as yeah. somebody was thinking about, but came from the action that the government put in place and the reaction of the customer, of the citizen. In fact, 80% of the reduction at the residential level yeah. came from action that were yeah. directed by the government and that were uh, you let me say used by the uh, and and accepted by yeah. the by the citizen mr Gallo, there, there's a lot of questions about of course chinese ownership or chinese um i guess you know uh, interference or at least um owning some of the companies in the west certainly in the u.s and in certain parts of europe as well gdp reti is partly owned by China. What's that relationship looking like? Well, uh, as of today, if I look back in the, my last seven years that I've been in Ital Gas, the relationship with state leaders China has been very, very nice. I mean, very cooperative. Uh, we had have exchange in terms of uh, knowledge and technologies, mm -hmm. but that's it. I mean, yeah. uh, the relationship has been very stable over time. Paolo Gallo, thank you so much for joining us. That was the Chief Executive Officer of Ital Gas. Coming up, we'll focus a little bit more on the energy sector, on the banking sector, and of course, we talk UK. The Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, prepares to defend his spring statement. We'll bring you the very latest on the UK economy next. This is Bloomberg. Italy.
a budget when conditions are allowed to 0.7. We'd like to keep the investment allowance at 100% past the three years that we've put in. Obviously, I'm very aware we have a very different banking system, but we in the UK are certainly not complacent. We have a very strong regulator in the Prudential Regulatory Authority, uh, which obviously helped us deal with the SVB situation a few weeks ago. We're pretty confident that we're in a, you know, we need to be vigilant, but we've got a stable situation in the UK. Well, that was the UK Chief Secretary to the Treasury, John Glenn, speaking about the resilience of the UK to the global banking turmoil. Now, the UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt is also testifying in front of the Treasury Select Committee today, where his recent spring budget is in focus. Now, let's bring in Bloomberg's economist, Jamie Ross. Jamie, great to see you. Now, when you look at you know, the, the banking crisis, I don't know how Jeremy Hunt will navigate uh, what this means for the economy. The UK seems to be fairly immune so far. Yeah, so we haven't had a bank run like we've seen in the US. We haven't had a systemically important business like Credit Suisse go under. Um, so it's good news, right? Um, but we're not immune to it. There, there is a tightening of financial conditions that's happening in the UK, as we're seeing elsewhere, and it's going to mean that the economy is going to probably grow a little bit slower. So it, but we're not seeing anything crisis-like yet. So is the BOE done hiking? Um, so I think if you look at the... If you look at the inflation data, that's, re that's been relatively firm lately. Uh, the banking crisis is going to take a about half percent off GDP, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Uh, that's pretty much offsetting, I think. So I, th I think the bank is basically done. So, Jamie, we're looking at live pictures, of course, of the Chancellor um, answering questions from the Select Committee. This is usually quite explosive. I mean, they don't pull punches. I don't know whether he'll, you know, they'll focus on inflation, on the, on the spring budget. Will he actually manage to have inflation like he's promised? I, I think, like, the, so the halving inflation thing is that it's like a massive open goal. It should be super easy because you'd need energy prices to go up by as much as they did last year to prevent inflation from falling. So I think that's, that's guaranteed. The big question, I think, is whether inflation settles at 3% or 4% or 2%. And that, you know, that's the thing that's keeping the Bank of England up at night and, uh, and, the, and the Chancellor can't really do much about it. Yeah, so what are the, the tough questions for him? Like, what would you ask him? Um, so I, I think there's, there's a lot of focus on, on the short term. There's, of, there's reasonable focus on the banking crisis. Mm -hmm. I mean, the big question is, what is he going to do about long-term growth? Right. We still haven't really had a coherent strategy, I don't think. There's nothing that I've heard that's been announced that's going to move the dial. And I think these are the pressing questions that need to be addressed most. Jamie, thank you so much. As always, Jamie Rush, I would urge everyone to check out, of course, Jamie and his team's uh, wonderful research. It's out on the Bloomberg Terminal, and sometimes we also put it out on social media, but it's smart. There are a couple of outlier calls certainly <clears throat> for what the Fed does. Now, you can also continue watching Jeremy Hunt's testimony in front of the Treasury Committee on your terminal at L-I-V-E, go, live, go. Now, we'll be covering all things UK every week on Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. London time in a half an hour special. Actually, this week, we have Sir Richard Dearlove, so we'll focus on defense. defense. He's, of course, former MI6 chief. What we'll focus on today is UBS bringing back Sergio Armadi as chief executive to oversee the Credit Suisse deal. One of the most poignant uh, moments for me certainly was the UBS chairman in that press conference saying this is such a hard task. It's actually harder, he thinks, than what happened 2008. This is Bloomberg. I have heard a lot of people thinking that we are going to have great cuts towards the end of this year. We're not in that camp that we're expecting the Fed to turn so quickly. I think the Fed narrative is certainly uh, a, a, an uncertain one in the context of those long and variable lags in terms of uh, policy. The longer we avoid recession, the deeper it's likely to be because by that time more things will break. To me, a recession probability is, is very high and rising. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. UBS goes back to the future. Sergio Emotti will return as CEO to oversee the acquisition of Credit Suisse. Jefferies gets hit by the deal-making slump. Quarterly profit plunges. A rise in equities and fixed income trading couldn't offset plummeting revenue at the investment bank. And a sign of hope for the chip-making industry, Micron gave a better forecast for the current quarter than expected and said customer inventories 
are getting better. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, a lot to talk about when it comes to the broad market themes, the China story of yesterday still rippling through global markets, causing some optimism. But really in Europe, our focus very much on Swiss banking once again and a return of a Mossi to the top of Swiss banking. Yeah, I would say it was a pretty amazing story to wake up to. And then it's really about banks, banks and banks. You've got Jeffries as well. You've got Goldman Sachs, a trio of executives uh, leaving there. So there's so much bank news today. If you thought it was going to be a slow news week, um, you've definitely been proved wrong. Take a look at what we're looking at in terms of the setup today. S&P futures are up substantially, more than eight tenths of one percent. We did end in losses yesterday, in the red yesterday, but we were pairing those losses going into the close. So only down the, on the S&P about one or really two tenths of one percent. You do have yields coming down, so investors are buying bonds, um, but they're still at 355, 356, right around where uh, we saw yields yesterday. And though you have the dollar rising, the Bloomberg dollar index is really pretty low. 1232, the quote on that. And if you've been watching it, it has come down substantially over the past couple of weeks. Then Bitcoin, I think another big surprise here, certainly Surging up to $28,540, it seems that investors, at least in uh, what we've heard is very thin liquidity, have brushed off concerns about the CFTC suit against Binance and are continuing to buy uh, the OG. Somebody here is lifting the offer. Take a look at what's going on in Asia. You did have big gains in Asia overnight as well. The MSCI uh, Pacific, the broader index up only about two thirds of 1%, but the Hang Seng gaining more than 2% in Hong Kong, the Nikkei gaining one and a third percent in Tokyo, and the US dollar strengthening a little bit here against the yen at 131.99. Anna? Let's have a look at what's going on then in Europe, Matt. And uh, we, you were talking yesterday about the news out of Alibaba, and that's had a chance to go through the Asian markets. As you point out, that's been a, a, a source of some positivity through the Asia session. And it seems to be having an impact here in Europe a little bit as well, or at least the, the positivity has lived on into the European session. Perhaps more IPOs in Hong Kong means more handbag sales in Paris. And we're seeing consumer products, the luxury side of things, doing well, and Paris outperforms as a result. Technology is also another sector really in focus. We talked about the Micron numbers in our our headlines, they were better than anticipated. Also, the numbers out of Infineon over in Germany. And they're, also, they're, they're suggesting that things are better because the auto sector is better. So they increase their revenue estimates. And this to do with the, uh, the business they do with the auto sector. So technology, a leading sector here in Europe today. Uh, to the downside, next. This is a kind of bellwether retail stock in the UK. The stock down by 6.2%. They're not going to have such pricing power in the second half of the year. So they won't put their prices up by 6%. It'll be more like 3%. That might be good for the overall general narrative around inflation. Inflation may be coming down. That might be a sort of early warning sign of that, but not great for margins. And so the stock under pressure. And here's UBS. We can't take our eyes off the banks for a moment. And certainly today the focus is on UBS. That stock up by 1.9% as they bring back Sergio Amotti. Here is Sergio Amotti speaking earlier at a press conference in Zurich. The responsibilities uh, that are coming with this important task and the expectations, uh, and uh, I'm fully aware that we need to work very hard here to avoid uh, any consequences for the taxpayers in Switzerland. So uh, I think uh, you have my word and commitment that I, together with my team, we will work and do everything that it takes to make this transaction successful. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Swiss finance reporter, Marion Halftermeyer, who was at the press conference. And Marion, huge news here. Um, I was pretty shocked to wake up to this. On the other hand, many people said they were waiting for UBS to bring back a Swiss leader, to bring back a big, powerful name, because this uh, acquisition has been so unpopular in the domestic market. Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, today in the press conference, we had three of the most powerful Swiss bankers, Swiss banking bankers um, in, in the country. And that's exactly right. I mean, despite the chairman, Colton Kelleher's words on the press conference in Bern when the deal was announced saying, you know, I will continue as chairman and Ralph Hammers will continue as CEO, there was a lot of conversation and, and rumors around, you know, would they need to bring back someone who's Swiss and also someone who might have more restructuring experience? And they found that in Sergio Amati. 
Yes, and they talk, uh, we got a little bit of insight, didn't we, from this press conference. Amazing insights. Uh, the fact that Kelleher called her Motti last Monday, so we know how those conversations started. What is next for Harmers then? And what will Motti focus on? I mean, the, the size and scope of the challenge ahead being reflected on a lot today. And the, uh, the chairman saying that this is bigger than the integrations that took place uh, in the financial services sector in 2008. That's right, exactly. And, and he also added, you know, that the board of directors felt that they had a better horse in Sergio Amati in going forward with this really important integration that will have ramifications globally in finance. Um, in terms of Ralph Hammers, he has expressed his desire to stay on and help Sergio Amati close the deal. And that um, insinuates that he's going to be focusing a lot on the regulatory side of things. A lot of regulators still need to approve, go through the motions of approving this deal. Um, Amati will be focusing on, you know, really looking at the business and seeing what they want to keep and in particular winding down that risk that Credit Suisse might be bringing to UBS in their investment bank. All right, Marion, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Marion Haftermeyer there reporting out of Zurich and she obviously has an incredibly busy day ahead of her. By the way, speaking of executive changes, another shakeup at Goldman Sachs, this time in capital markets, Michael Marsh will uh, head EMEA Financing, John Greenwood, Latin America and Zhang Li, Asia Pacific Ex Japan, and you've had three executives leave uh, Goldman Sachs because of the slump in deal making they've seen. Meanwhile, over at Jefferies, um, profits plunged in, in its fiscal first quarter as a bump in equities and fixed income trading failed to offset a slump in deal making and investment banking. Joining us for more is Bloomberg Managing Editor of Finance, Michael Moore. So, Michael, um, the Goldman story, the Jeffries story, what are these telling us about the IB environment? Yeah, I think the, the takeaway here is that the slowdown we saw last year is not over. It's continuing into 2023. And what's interesting, I thought, from the Goldman news is you saw a couple of those bankers going to boutique firms. And traditionally, the... the you know, conventional wisdom was it's better to ride out a downturn at one of the big shops. But, you know, we have seen those boutiques kind of mature and, you know, perhaps they're using this opportunity as a chance to pick up uh, talent from some of the big firms like Goldman that saw bonuses way down last year. Yes, that's a really interesting uh, development. And, and this might be something that we having more obvious impact on banks that compete in the same space here in Europe if it yeah. weren't for the UBS story, which is sort of eclipsed it in the European time zone, Michael. But something we've really focused on on the last, uh, well, last few days of trading, I suppose, is what on earth happened on Friday with the movements in the Deutsche Bank share price and a lot of people drawing links between CDS. We've done some really interesting reporting on this, though, and digging into the detail of what caused those movements in the CDS market on Deutsche. Yeah, regulators are looking at, uh, you know, a single trade in the CDS market uh, that may have helped push spreads out on some of the subordinated debt, uh, the CDS tied to that. Uh, and that may have spooked investors on Friday and started this kind of ripple effect. And we've seen markets are very jittery, very fragile after the Credit Suisse news. Uh, people kind of on edge and all it takes perhaps is is that one move and I think this will raise kind of more long-term questions over you know do investors need to adjust how they read some of these markets or do regulators uh, need to look at the transparency of some of those illiquid markets all right Michael thanks very much so many moving parts so many bank stories Bloomberg News impressively on top of it obviously uh, covering banks is our bread and butter. Let's get to tech, though. Alibaba shares are surging after it surprised markets by announcing plans yesterday to split its $220 billion empire into six pieces. The Chinese e-commerce uh, giant says it will divide into units that will individually raise funds and explore initial public offerings, a possibility of that. BDA chairman Duncan Clark struck an optimistic tone on the overhaul. It's a symbol of some fresh capital coming into some of these companies, some some new transactions, obviously, which will help the more abundant sort of IPO pipeline. I agree, it's going to take time, but it's uh, finally a positive signal um, for the company and for the markets. All right, and if you look at Alibaba uh, shares live, they've actually fallen. Bloomberg's Alex Webb joins us now for more. And Alex, we've had kind of 24 hours to digest this story. The headlines broke on this program yesterday. Um, what more do we know now? But ultimately, there are three sets of good news and one overhang. The first is that uh, the concern had been 
that from coming from China that Alibaba and other big tech companies in that country had got too big and had too great a role. Well, by breaking them up, that means perhaps there's not so much going to be as much regulatory interference because they are going to be six far smaller companies. The second part is that the value valuation come massively down from a sort of $320 peak from on the ADRs to, you know, they were trading around 90 after yesterday's news. Um, and, and the final part, of course, is that... Uh, there's the opportunity, I think, shareholder sense to create more shareholder value here. That by, you know, if there is any sort of uh, uh, conglomerate discount, maybe that gets unlocked. Amidst all of that, still the massive overhang that China can change its mind, uh, you know, at the flip of a coin in, at very short notice, mm. um, and you don't quite know what that's going to bring. Yeah, it's interesting what this tells us about the broader regulatory environment in China. Also, the, some of the parts analysis, why six small bits of Alibaba might be worth more than the whole. Lots to talk about then when it comes to this, Alex. But also in tech news, we've been covering the Micron story, Micron sales forecast, uh, spurring hope that the worst uh, could be over for these chip makers. And here in Europe, we had numbers out of Infineon, which also told a positive story. Yeah, it's the real word here, key word here is demand. What you see in the chip industry is a huge push and pull that it, re it finds that there's too much demand, so there's huge invent, um, investment in new supply. That can take 18 months, two years to come online. But then when it does all come online, they find there's too much supply and not enough demand. So what's happened in the most recent cycle is that they've been taking supply down in some cases, or at least not expanding it, with the massive exception of Samsung in memory chips. They did not cut back on their supply piece, which was creating huge issues for the rest of the market. What we're now seeing is that Micron is saying that in memory chips there is you know, an increase in demand, more than had been expected. And secondly, we have Infineon here in Europe, which makes all sorts of controllers, not least for cars, but also for um, industrials. They're also talking about an uptick in demand. So lots of good news in the semiconductor market, which underpins, frankly, all of the technology that we use. All right, Alex, Bloomberg's Alex Webb there uh, explaining a lot to us. Really appreciate it. He's also had an incredibly busy week. Uh, check out his piece on Bloomberg Originals. I watched it yesterday, and it was quite informative. Let's take a look now at some of the stocks that are moving in the pre-market today. Lululemon is a huge one, jumping 13% in change after the company gave an annual outlook that beat analyst expectations, driven by high demand for yoga pants and the other stuff that Lululemon makes, even as it deals with issues in the supply chain and in its inventory that are eating into margins, I should say, maybe a bloated inventory, although bloated probably not the best word to use when talking about Lululemon. Micron, the largest U.S. maker of memory chips, Alex was just talking about this, gave us a better forecast for the current quarter than some analysts had feared, and that sparks a little bit of hope that the worst of the brutal industry slump may be behind us in terms of uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the chip. Um, uh, I guess there were too many, far too many chips because we had a PC slump in terms of demand. And then Lucid, the electric car maker, I'm following this very closely, cutting about 1,300 jobs um, as the startup reviews, quote, all non-critical spending at this time. That's not something you want to hear as an investor. Um, nonetheless, I guess the, the job cuts are, uh, it's up 2.4%. That restructuring is going to cost them 24 to $30 million. And I guess the market has said it's worth it in this case. Anna? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we will talk about the markets more broadly when we come back then, Matt. We'll talk to Christian Kopp later this hour, Union Investment Head of Fixed Income and FX. What is the direction of travel for fixed income markets if we've made our way through the drama in the financial services sector? We'll also talk to David Dindy about that drama in financial services, the CEO of the fintech platform Atomic Invest. What kind of business uptick are they seeing as a result of the, uh, the difficulties faced by certainly the smaller end of the retail banking space in the US? This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. We are simulcast on both Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. Um, however, a after I say that, every time, uh, this, every day this time, I then show a chart so the people on radio can't see it. I, I probably should change the wording. In any case, um, take a look at this chart for those of you who are tuned in on television. And for those of you on radio, I will walk you through it. It shows the S&P 500. Uh, one line priced in dollars 
and one line priced in euros. The uh, yellow line there in euros, the white line in U.S. dollars. And what we've seen is a weakness in the dollar index, and that has masked the uh, performance, I think, of the S&P 500. At least it's boosted it um, in terms of dollar investors, uh, and, and it's uh, shown a little bit more weakness in terms of euro investors. Let's bring in Nora Melinda, Bloomberg Equities reporter, uh, right now very early in the morning. Yes. I'm, I'm just babbling on, but you get my point, right? Yes. It's been interesting to watch this um, what looks like a rally, but when you take the dollar out of the picture, it's not so great. Exactly. And as we saw in the chart, as you guys can see um, on radio and listen into, but um, what's really been interesting the past couple weeks, of course, we've been talking banks, 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 as you were saying earlier, Matt, but um, while all this bank chaos has been going on, last week, Bank of America clients actually posted the largest inflows into U.S. equities since October. And that's really interesting for two reasons. One, because a lot of these investors were actually pouring their money into singular stocks. They were doing a little bit of stock picking versus pouring their money into passive um, investments such as ETFs. But secondly, um, they poured a lot of their money into health and tech stocks. So we're seeing a lot of movement in that sector specifically, but that's a mm. really, really interesting thing that I've been looking at. And um, you can look a little bit further on that story um, by my colleague Alexandra Simonova. Okay, we'll look that up on the Bloomberg Temple. Yeah. Good morning to you, Nora. Morning. Uh, so, uh, so stock picking is back, which is an exciting uh, new conversation we can start having. But thinking about the banking sector, which has been such a focus for us, Nora, of course, in re recent weeks, what is the market looking forward to, either there or maybe elsewhere for a change? Yes, so always data going on. Of course, um, we have the Fed meeting that everyone is always looking forward to. But in between there, we're going to have some jobs data as well as PCE data that is upcoming. And of course... That is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. But speaking to sources, our team has really been hearing that investors are actually more so went from trading on inflation to now trading on recession fears. And so, of course, this conversation of recession has been ongoing. But to really see that shift is a really remarkable thing. You know, uh, Alex Webb was talking about, uh, about Micron to us. I was showing um, right. the share movement here. It's really interesting because chips have been kind of hard to, to follow, right? There weren't enough for cars. There were way too many for PCs. What can we glean from this Micron um, earnings report? Yes, yeah, so as you all mentioned earlier, uh, Micron did report better than, expect, better than expected forecast for the current quarter. And that really begs the question as to how will this actually affect or trickle into other um, companies in the sector. Um, of course, we saw the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index down more than 36% last year, but now we're seeing it up about 20%. So there could be a positive story there. Nora, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Nora Melinda with the latest on the markets. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go. That's where you'll find uh, the whole Markets Live blog. Great insights into everything that's going on day to day on markets. That's on the Bloomberg terminal. MLIV Go. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky warns that a Russian victory in the city of Bakhmut could be perilous. He told the Associated Press that Moscow could then build international support for a deal that would force Ukraine to make unacceptable compromises. Zelensky also invited China's President Xi Jinping to visit despite China's ties with Russia. In France, allies of President Emmanuel Macron fear that street violence aimed at his pension reform is spiraling out of control. Supporters in the National Assembly are still backing the controversial plan, but several of them are urging Macron to find a way to take the heat out of demonstrations. One option would be to call for a pause on the pension legislation. And Bloomberg's learned that J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon will be deposed over the bank's ties to late financier Jeffrey Epstein. The deposition is connected to two cases brought against J.P. Morgan by an alleged Epstein victim and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Epstein was a J.P. Morgan client for five years, even after he pleaded guilty to soliciting a minor for prostitution. 
And the Federal Reserve's internal watchdog has launched its own investigation into the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. The review will assess the bank's supervision by the Fed Board of Governors in Washington and examiners at the San Francisco Fed. The Fed's vice chair for supervision is leading his own probe of Silicon Valley Bank. And it seems like after watching the testimony yesterday, Anna, regulators uh, noticed again and again and again that there were problems. And other than mentioning it to various people, they didn't really do anything about it. Mm, well, and they certainly seem to split on party lines on some of the future of regulation here, didn't they? Uh, Warren and Co. and the Democrats talking more about the need for more regulation. Republicans saying it's more about implementing the regulations that already exist. A conversation that will run and run in Washington. We will be across that. Next, we'll be across fixed income markets. We'll talk about that with Christian Kopf, who joins us shortly. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. UBS goes back to the future. Sergio Amati will return as CEO to oversee the acquisition of Credit Suisse. Jefferies gets hit by the deal-making slump. Quarterly profit plunges. A rise in equities and fixed income trading could not offset plummeting revenue at the investment bank. And a sign of hope for the chip-making industry, Micron gave a better forecast for the current quarter than had been expected and said customers or customer inventories are getting better. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And US futures then, Matt, looking pretty positive. It seems we've got another day where markets perhaps focus on some of the positives coming through from Asia, the Hong Kong tech session, uh, tech session in particular, pretty positive. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like a buy-everything day, really. If you take a look at my board, you'll see not only do we have a substantial gain in US futures, futures, but we also see that our investors are buying the 10-year as well as the U.S. dollar and Bitcoin. Some of the levels I find really interesting here, especially the dollar index, even with the buying, it's only at 1231, which is a relatively low level. So it still, I think, provides a tailwind for risk assets. And then Bitcoin soaring back above $28,000 um, says that, uh, we, OK, we know it's a low liquidity market, but still somebody's lifting the offer here. Um, and that means they're brushing off concerns about the CFTC and Binance. Take a look at some of the crypto stocks that are moving. You've got Riot Blockchain uh, gaining in the pre-market more than 8%. Marathon Digital up more than 6%. And Coinbase up almost 4% in the pre-market. So some big gains there. And then all of the movers really that I'm looking at this morning are gaining as well. Lululemon shares. We've been talking about this up after the company gave an annual outlook that beat analysts' expectations. High demand for athleisure wear. I don't know if I love or hate saying that word, even as it deals with <laughs> nagging inventory issues that ate into margins. Plus, Micron, we've been talking about all morning as well. Um, does this tell us that the chip, the worst of the chip story is behind us? Because it's the largest U.S. maker of memory chips, and it gave a better forecast for the current quarter than some analysts had feared. There had been a real glut in these kind uh, of chips, and maybe they're working that off. And then Lucid, the uh, electric car making startup, has been a real concern. I mean, the shares are down 70% over the last year, but now it's cutting uh, jobs 1,300, that's about 18% of the workforce, and it's reviewing all non critical spending at this time. To me, that clause is a concern, but investors like it at least from this point to bid up the shares of 775 in the pre market. The restructuring plan is going to cost um, maybe up to $30 million, and investors judging that that's worth it. Anna, what do you see in terms of the European mm. um, stock market? Yeah, we see European stocks going higher this morning than Matt. We're up by nine tenths of one percent, so not far from session highs, actually, as we go through uh, this morning. And U.S. futures not far from those highs as well. So that's interesting. Uh, we're seeing strength coming through in technology. We're seeing strength coming through in consumer uh, products, in particular the luxury goods in Paris. They do well when sentiment in Asia is is strong, and so that's something we're watching. This is the source of the optimism around technology. The micron numbers, for sure, Matt, that you mentioned, and that really fits well with the narrative we heard from Infineon, the German uh, chip making business. 7% higher for this stock as they said that their revenue numbers were going to come in higher than had been estimated and that is because they're supplying more to the auto sector than they thought they would. Here's another mover over in Paris this time up by 2.5% for uh, the aircraft manufacturer that is Airbus, the giant of, uh, of aviation. They were going to buy a stake in a part of a business that is uh, owned at the moment by Atos. They're now not going to do that and so as a result their stock goes higher. The Atos share price on the other hand sinking this morning. UBS is up by 1.8% because 
because we just don't want to take our eyes off this story today. Uh, they're bringing back Sergio Motti as the new CEO just two weeks after taking over Credit Suisse, just two weeks after saying that the CEO of UBS, who currently sits in post, who's Ralph Harmers, would keep that job. Well, he won't. He's going to stay for a transition period, but Sergio Motti is back running this Swiss giant. Matt? All right, so uh, that is a huge story that, at least for me, was a big shock um, to see this morning. We're going to continue to cover that. But I do want to get to something. I can't believe we haven't said the word Fed in the first 34 minutes of the show. So let's do that right now. St. Louis Fed President James Bullard says rates are directed at inflation, not bank stress. Obviously. He wrote this in an essay yesterday <laughs> that the banking crisis can be contained without using interest rates. However, markets are doubting this message, pricing in 50 basis points of Fed cuts in the second half of this year. No matter how many times Jay Powell says, we're not going to cut this year, markets are still pricing them in. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel joins us to help make sense of this. So, Valerie, what's the story here? Look, hedge fund shorts have really capitulated when it comes to front end interest rates. They really don't believe Fed, uh, uh, what Powell told us or what Bullard mentioned yesterday. And the extent to which this positioning has been unwound was so quick. You can see this red, this red dot here. That is the extent of the short positioning we got to when uh, Powell was mentioning that 50 basis points was back on the table in terms of their rate hike pace. How quickly that was wiped out just as the SVB collapse happened. And we're now pricing in 50 basis points of rate cuts at the end of the year. But I'll tell you why, Matt. There are some people out there in the market that will argue that the regional banking woes do not end until the Fed cuts rates. They cannot be competitive with money markets uh, yielding 4 to 5 percent. And they cannot be competitive when it comes to holding on uh, to their deposits. Nor does their business model make sense when the yield curve is this inverted. That is not fixed until the Fed cuts. But we, given this front end positioning turned around so quick, it would be prudent of us to discuss how quickly could this short end positioning come back? How quickly could that short positioning in treasuries come back? I'll paint you a picture using the rest of this week's data. Jobless claims comes in tight. The Fed's balance sheet data we get on Thursday shows that the new lending facility had little take up. Maybe some of those regional banks were bold enough to pay some of that liquidity back. PCE on Friday comes in hot, especially in those super core measures. And finally, Friday after the close, that deposit data we get from the Fed, it maybe it shows inflows into U.S. Uh, small banks. That would be the scenario that would lead us to believe that the Treasury shorts could come roaring back, and maybe we'll believe Powell when he mentions that cuts are not on the table. Okay, really interesting analysis. Thank you very much, Bloomberg's Valerie Titel, with the ways that we could get back to focusing on inflation, inflation, inflation after the banking drama. Let's get the thoughts of Christian Koff, head of fixed income and FX at Union investment. Christian, so good to have you with us. Thank you very much for your time. Where do you think yields head from here, given what Valerie was outlining there, that the, the movement we've seen in Treasuries in recent weeks, given the banking turmoil, but also the ongoing focus in many geographies on inflation? Yes, I will give you a European perspective on that. We just had the keynote address of President Lagarde at last week's ECB Watchers Conference, and she said that three elements dictate the ECB's reaction function at this juncture. She said it's uh, the forecast for headline inflation, it is the current pace of underlying inflation, and it is tr the transition of monetary policy. And what we're now witnessing is an endogenous tightening of financial conditions through the banking sector, through the stress in the banking sector, and that means the ECB and the Fed will likely have to hike less. That said, we still expect some further hikes uh, taking us to 3.75% uh, on the ECB policy rate and also one or two further rate hikes in the Fed because the stress in the banking sector is not sufficient uh, to really uh, lead to a pause here in rate hikes. Yes, so I suppose we're all focused then on the extent to which in the US, in the Eurozone and elsewhere, Christian, we see the provision of credit being dialed back, just how, how much that changes as a result of the events that we saw over at SVB and Credit Suisse for what it's worth. What's your expectation of, of whether we see a step change in the availability of credit from here? Yes. So I think what's very important is this uh, banking sector turmoil is very different from past turmoils because it really hasn't got much to do with the uh, credit quality, with the asset quality of those banks. Banks are relatively well capitalized and we're not talking about credit losses here. What we're talking about here is a decline in the mark to market of securities held by banks. And that decline in the mark to market is quite dramatic and it is caused by the very rapid rise of policy rates on both sides of the Atlantic. 
So we think that banks will be more cautious here in, uh, in lending uh, to the real economy because they face those pressures on uh, the deposit side of their business and because we do have an inverted yield curve now. So we do expect some slowdown in credit provisioning. But it's important to keep in mind that this is not due to the fact that we have massive credit losses on the asset side of the balance sheet. We don't see those big credit losses. In fact, you know, even if you look at... Uh, even if you look at the mark-to-market -market losses, some estimates say that uh, the uh, securities held uh, to maturity in the European banking system, if you were to mark to mark them uh, directly, it would subtract around 0.6% of risk-weighted assets and uh, reduce uh, core equity by the same amount. So it's not huge amounts, really, that we're talking about. Hey, hey Christian, Matt Miller here in New York. Um, we have seen some uh, deposit outflows, obviously, uh, across the banking industry. I know that here in the U.S., uh, apparently, you're more likely to get divorced than ever change a bank in your lifetime. In Germany, you have just <laughs> as fragmented a banking market. But I'm sure that, you know, investors there keep their savings book in one place normally. What kind of deposit outflows have you seen? Well, there are two differences between the U.S. and uh, the Europe. The first difference is the U.S. is much more transparent. You know, you get weekly data on the deposit movements, and you get weekly data, also almost daily data, on the changes in money market funds. That also has to do with the fact that money market funds deal with the Fed, you know? Uh, they go into the reverse repo facility of the Fed, while this is impossible here in Europe. So the first difference is much more transparency in the, in the US compared to Europe. The second difference is that I think the granularity of deposits in the European banking sector is much bigger, you know? I mean, the, the, the mm. institutions that have been under problem here, uh, under trouble here, these are all institutions which have had a very small portion of insured deposits. Look at Silicon Valley Bank, less than 10%. Uh, Credit Suisse, 15% insured deposits, no? Yeah. While the, the, the amount of insured deposits in the European banks is much bigger. We're talking about 60 70%. So this is why I think that the risk of a sudden deposit outflow is less severe here in Europe than it is uh, for some of those U.S. banks. But, Christian, you bring up an interesting point that I... Uh, really want to focus on today, and that is, um, is retail money really moving out of banks and into broker-dealers? Is it really moving out of savings accounts and into money market funds? Because that seems like a heavy lift for, uh, for a retail, for a consumer to me. Yeah. So two points on that. First of all, you're absolutely right. The flows that we're seeing are mainly corporate deposits, which are fleeing the system and going elsewhere. Yeah. That's the first point. It's not a retail flow. Yeah. The second point is you have to keep in mind that the regime in the U.S. is different from Europe. No? In the U.S., the money goes into a money market fund. The money market fund goes to the reverse repo facility of the Fed, and the deposits leave the system. In the, Europe, in the euro area, we don't have that. Yeah? So whenever you move a deposit from one bank, you're going to move it to another bank. When you move it into a money market fund, that money market fund is going to buy securities, and the, the cash is going to wind up in another bank. So we've got a closed deposit system in the euro area. You don't have that in the U.S. Yeah, In the U.S., you've got the reverse repo facility, which means that deposits are leaving the banking system for good. They go back to the central bank. And so, Christian, taking a global view of this, then, do you expect that banks will just have to um, reward investors with higher interest rates? And yes. if so, what does that do to your universe? But, you know, they want to hold on to those deposits. What does that do to, to the universe in which you operate, the sort of fixed income and FX world? Well... What it does is uh, we're going to see a bit of a rise here. Uh, again, the banks will have to reward their deposits more. The net interest margin of banks will decline. Yeah, uh, We already see a sharp separation in the spreads between financials and non-financials. Yeah? So uh, the borrowing costs both uh, on the bond market and on the deposit side for financial institutions will, will rise. That will lead to lower margins for those banks. But, you know, they're starting from a healthy point and actually... Um, I think that overall, the increase in, in interest rates is positive for bank earnings. Yeah, So the bank deposits will have to rise. The rates will have to rise on those bank deposits. Christian, I spent, I spent many years in, in Frankfurt and, as well as Berlin covering Deutsche Bank. There was a lot of turmoil for some time, but it seems to have recovered well until we saw the huge drops on Friday. What's the confidence like in Europe's biggest economy, uh, in its biggest bank? Well, we've seen the announcement by the head of the EBA, the European Banking Authority, this morning, uh, and he, actually last night, and he mentioned that apparently there was a very big single-name CDS trade going through the system, which has caused that turmoil, yeah? We have gone through all the numbers, uh, and uh, I'm not, I mean, any, any fixed-income portfolio manager is going to have a healthy dose of paranoia, yeah? Uh, but we've gone through all <laughs> the numbers. We don't see any news here on Deutsche Bank. We don't see any news. 
OK. And, and we know that there was that one big trade that, that had a big impact in quite an illiquid market. Christian, thank you so much for bringing us a, a little bit of the paranoia that is useful and your knowledge of fixed incomes, uh, fixed income markets and much beyond. Christian Kopf of Union Investments. Coming up, UBS brings back a familiar face to oversee the Credit Suisse deal. We will hear from the company on their plans ahead. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with former FDIC Chairman Bill Isaac. That's at 1 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. Colleagues uh, who together made UBS so strong that we're actually in a position to save credit Suisse, to stabilize the situation, to support the Swiss financial system, and to help Switzerland. That was outgoing UBS CEO Ralph Hammers talking about the transition. If you woke up this morning uh, with a sense of shock, reading that Sergio Marti, Ermati uh, is coming back to lead UBS, you are not alone. Many people, though, may have expected this Anna, as um, so many Swiss have uh, apparently, in a sense, revolted against this takeover, mm. this forced takeover. It's been incredibly unpopular, according to polling. I think 80% of Swiss people were against it. And so maybe UBS yeah. had to do something, bring in a big name, bring in a Swiss name, because uh, I don't... I don't think they're xenophobic, but having lived in the area for many, many years, they don't always love a foreigner. I remember when uh, there was a Swiss leader of Deutsche Bank, and that didn't go down so well, at least at the beginning either. So um, a lot of times it helps to bring in a local to run the business. Yeah, especially when tough, uh, times are tough and the challenges are big. Let us put that question to Bloomberg Swiss Bureau Chief, Chief uh, uh, Claudia Megler, who joins us now in Zurich. Uh, very good to have you with us. I mean, how much was the, the, the Swissness of Emossi a thing here? Because we heard from Keller today, uh, talk, the chairman, talking about how uh, it, it was a nice to have, it wasn't a deciding factor, but at the margin, being Swiss helps. I wonder if that is part of the job, convincing the Swiss people that, that, that Switzerland has got this. Well, that is certainly part of his job now going forward. Um, you mentioned the polling in the beginning. I think, um, yeah, I think uh, half of the people weren't, you know, didn't really approve of this merger. That was the latest polls from, from over the weekend. So, um, yes, it's, it's certainly part of his role um, to now kind of, you know, create stability. And I think there's also this a bit of an unspoken rule that you kind of either have a chairman or the CEO being Swiss. Um, and obviously, in, in the previous setting with um, Hammers and Kelleher, that was wasn't, that wasn't the case. But obviously, Amati isn't just there because he's Swiss. You know, he's he ran the bank for nine years. He did a really good job turning it around back then. So I think the hope is that he can now um, help with this um, yeah mega deal that's happening. I mean, Kelleher couldn't stress enough how big of a how big of a um, you know a task this is uh, merging um, two systemically relevant banks. You know, my first question, Cloudy, this morning was, if Amati's the guy now. Uh, why wasn't he the guy two years ago? Why did he leave and get replaced by Ralph? I think it was a, a slightly different time back then. Um, you know, th things have changed back then. Hammers um, was tasked at the time with uh, trying to uh, transform the bank towards, um, you know, in into this digital age, kind of bring it forward in that sense. Um, so that, and, and helping, um, ha trying to help uh, serve a wider group of, of rich clients. And that strategy kind of fell apart when um, the... Um, the planned purchase of Wealthfront in the U.S. when that was scrapped, so that kind of, you know, didn't didn't help him. But I think, I mean, what was really really stressed in this press conference was how Kelleher and everybody involved believes that Armotti is really the best man for the job. Mm. 
and he was saying that he was honoured to be asked, wasn't he, Claudia? He was saying that he was honoured. It was a, he felt a, a call of duty that this was his duty to do this, and he certainly the wording from UBS night. really interesting, suggesting that um, that Harmers was stepping down for various reasons, one of them for the sake of the country. Uh, so certainly that 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 playing in here. Uh, Motti saying it'll take a couple of months to have all have some of the answers about what happens here because there are big challenges scaling down that that legacy Credit Suisse investment bank will be one of those. Yeah, there are many, many challenges. And, and I mean, in Switzerland, one of the big concerns here that, that you know, the people have is the jobs that are on the line. Credit Suisse had already said that they were going to cut about 9,000 jobs uh, globally. So now, you know, we'll have to see. There, there's obviously more cost cutting coming. Um, but what was also made clear in this press conference is that it, it will still take some while to sort out all the, the different variables here. And that things, you know, they haven't yet, the, the merger hasn't been completed or the takeover hasn't been completed. So um, I guess the next uh, two big um, moments will come next week when both banks hold AGMs. All right, Claudia, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate your insight. Bloomberg, Claudia Madler there in Zurich talking to us about this uh, big banking story. This is Bloomberg. This is a textbook case of, of bank mismanagement. We were seeing serious stress at other institutions. We have used important tools to act quickly to prevent contagion. We will continue to closely monitor conditions in the banking system. They are tools we would use again. Prepared to use all of our tools. To ensure that Americans' deposits are safe. We are committed to ensuring that all deposits are safe. Depositors will continue to have access to their savings. Our banking system is sound and resilient. Regional banks in the United States remain a, a source of strength for the system. Some of the most important regulators in the country yesterday testifying before the Senate, outlining what's likely to be the biggest regulatory overhaul of the banking sector in years. Certainly is an overhang for the stocks. Today we're going to get a House hearing on the recent bank failures, and you could see a little bit more uh, spiciness um, when it comes to the House, obviously, it's a much bigger institution, and mm. you've got um, uh, people on extreme sides on, of both uh, uh, both sides. Uh, so you could hear a lot more, especially about crypto, Anna. I'm, I'm going right. to uh, watch closely today for comments about crypto, because there have been complaints that maybe the signature bank shutdown had more to do with crypto than it did uh, to do with the balance sheet, although that's been denied by regulators, will certainly be uh, interesting okay. and probably also entertaining as well. That, that sounds like something to watch, whether the crypto uh, sphere gets more of a mention today. The focus yesterday was much more on just the sort of broad push for regulation from the Democratic side and Republicans saying, well, hang on, maybe just existing rules needed to be implemented more. Interesting to think about what happens with bank runs whilst we're also, uh, you know, digitally native these days and able to move our, our money around so quickly. Yeah, I think there's nothing you could do about a bank run. If it hits you, you can't be saved. Right, that's a nice place to leave the conversation. That's it for early edition surveillance is ahead. Uh, they'll be hearing from Jeffrey Yu from BMY Mellon, amongst other voices. This is Bloomberg.